Hey guys, we're taking a look at some out of this world stones today. We've got a ton of specimens. Meteorites versus tektites. We're talking about space stuff today, baby. So let's get right down into it. You want to read the clue? Sure. Looks like there's a clue in here. From the cosmos they invade, but not to conquer or to raid. Oh, well, what a relief. So they're not yeah. aliens. <laughs> oh, Ooh. there's a box in Oh, the cool. Box. There's. <laughs> when oh. was the last time we had a box in a box? That's it's wild. been a while. The fact that these fell from space and now they're just here on this plain old table is wild. Okay, so these are meteorites, but do you want to get, do you want to open that box? Whoa, uh, check this guy out. Oh my gosh. So Look at that slice. We know what that is. We've yeah, seen that yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen photos of this guy, but it's been a while since we crossed paths. Okay, let's dive into this. We have on this table meteorites, but also a piece of palisitic peridot. Yeah. And that's this piece that was in the other box. But let's let's dive in and talk about what a meteorite is. So a meteorite is material from space that crashes down to Earth. A lot of times when it hits the atmosphere, it breaks up into much smaller shrapnel and will just sort of disperse out across the surface of the Earth. So these here are called octahedrites. And that's because they're octahedral on a microscopic level. You can see they're really metallic looking. Mm -hmm. They have high iron contents. These two are chondrites. These are really stony. And they have a various uh, composition of different minerals and whatnot, but they're made of chondrules, which are tiny spheres of formerly molten and then cooled rock. And these chondrules are, I can't get over this, some of the oldest material in the universe. They're about as old as Earth is, 4.5 billion years old. And this is the most common type of meteorite mm -hmm. that's that you're gonna find on the Earth. We have some information about these two, which I think is really fun. This piece was found in Arizona, and it was first found in 1995. It was found near Kingman, Arizona, and it was found as part of a gold prospecting mission. And actually it can get really frustrating for people looking for gold because they set off metal detectors. Oh, that's so and funny. So, you know, you think you've struck it big. And then this piece was found in the Sahara Desert. We mentioned that meteors, they hit the atmosphere and a lot of them dissolve away. Some of them become shrapnel and they'll land like in the ocean and we'll never see them. Or they land in like really large, vast areas like the Sahara Desert, which is where that piece was from. What'll happen is like, you'll have nomads traveling through the desert and on the white sands of the Sahara, those things stand out pretty distinctly and they'll just pick them up and then when they get to town, they'll just sell them. Let's go to the, the octahedrites. For sure. Because I think those are pretty pretty cool. Right off the bat, they're way more metallic in luster than the chondrites. Super dense. Typically, meteorites are gonna have really high iron contents. They actually are magnetic. The date of the find for this one was 1576. One defining feature that indicates something is probably a meteorite is something called a regmaglyph. Regmaglyphs or thumbprints. And so basically there are these thumbprinty type of indentations on the surface. The absence of them doesn't mean that you don't have a meteorite, but the presence of them is a pretty good indication that you do have one. So this one was found in the USSR, and what's cool about this, when the meteor hit the atmosphere, a ton of people saw it, and they heard it as well, like a thunderous noise, like an explosion in the sky, and they saw it split up into shrapnel which rained down on the ground and some of the pieces embedded into like trees and stuff. And so nowadays a lot of people find remnants of that occurrence, like with metal detectors in trees. Imagine metal detecting vertically. You're, instead of sweeping the ground, you're like so up boring. above at eye level. Yeah, no, so they're like metal detecting trees and they'll find it in, in wood and stuff. So this one is from Argentina. So the Spanish actually discovered this find in the late 16th century, but this piece in particular was found in 1988, actually at a higher altitude. So it seemed that some of the pieces fell at like a lower basin and then some fell into the mountains. It's relatively new, so to speak, from a find, although it's quite old. Yeah, so that, it, that area is famous for meteorite finds. 
Uh, it's called Campo del Cielo, which means field of the sky or heaven loosely. And since it's at a higher elevation, it's drier. And so it doesn't develop as much rust as it would have if it had fallen in the lower elevation, like basins and stuff. Let's move on to that one. We haven't talked about that. That is Whoa. a piece of lunar brescia, which is a piece of the moon. So we were talking about the atmosphere of, of Earth. The moon does not have an atmosphere and it is riddled with impact craters from meteorites. It gets hit relatively often. When it does, sometimes pieces break off of the moon, get pulled in by our planet's gravity, and we get little lunar rocks. And this one's not so little, actually. Yeah. This is a pretty big chunk of moon, which even though it didn't come from as far away, is still mind boggling to think that I'm holding a piece of a celestial body that is just not, not this planet. So this was found in Morocco in 2019. Lunar brescia is kind of glassy. So you can see there are different colors going on here. So it's compacted with several different materials um, that have come from the, the moon's surface and that have kind of conglomerated and come back here. Okay, so that last piece is a really fun one. A lot of people like this type of material. That's called palisitic peridot. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is a thin, thin slice, which is beautiful because it allows a lot of light to get through the peridot specks, the peridot blotches in this slice of a mix of nickel iron, like these guys, and silica. So palisites are a type of meteorites that are composed of equal parts iron nickel and silicate. So what you have here is this yellowish green is more of the silicate material, and then obviously this metallic looking matrix, so yeah, to speak. Sure. Is, is the iron, um, the stony iron material. Meteors have cores and mantles, mm -hmm. and whereas these octahedrites come from the core, the silicate, or that greenish yellow, comes from the mantle. So they're not exactly sure how you get that structure and how the two parts of the meteor combine, but the thought is potentially it has something to do with uh, how it's impacted or how it hits the atmosphere. All right, you ready for the next box? Yeah, let's do it. Oh, this one's got a clue as well. Born from fire in the sky where meteors and Earth collide. This supernatural glass is found not in space, but on the ground. I'm loving these rhymes. Oh, oh you guys are gonna love this. Oh, look at that piece. We have three different varieties of tektites here. Yes. So they're all types of glass. So this is Libyan desert glass. This is Moldavite. And these are what are called Indochinite. Tektites are different than meteorites. Yes. As we mentioned, these are all types of glass. So SiO2. Yeah. One way to remember what a tektite is, is another name for it is an impactite. Mm -hmm. So whereas meteorites come to the earth, they become meteorites as a result of a meteor hitting the atmosphere and breaking up. A tektite is a result of a meteorite impact on the earth, a shooting back into the atmosphere, intense heat is applied, and the quickness with which it reforms creates this glass, and then the glass falls back to earth. It's always got this amorphous shape uh, as a result of that rapid cooling. Uh, and re-solidifying on its way back down to the ground. So they get sent for dozens of miles in the air and they cool down. And what's cool is sometimes you can form this stuff into jewelry or you can facet it. So like with the case of this Libyan desert glass, this is glass that was formed as a result of a meteor impact on the surface of the earth. And then someone found a large chunk of it and faceted it. Mm -hmm into these beautiful things. And you can see on the inside, actually, lots of little inclusions and air bubbles, which result from that rapid cooling process as it flies through the air. Yes, the Libyan desert glass has kind of the haziness or a cloudiness to it. Usually found in Western Egypt, Eastern Libya. These have an ancient history as well. The Pharaoh Tutankhamun, he had a scarab carved from this material on his breastplate, on his chest plate. So finding Libyan desert glass in sizes large enough to cut something this big out of it is crazy. I mean, imagine, we've seen how much material goes to waste when you cut and facet it. So imagine the size of the piece that this came from. I mean, and contrast it to that piece of rough in size. Yeah. It's crazy. 
So again, it's glass, so it's primarily pure silica, but you also have trace elements that provide the color. So you have iron oxides, calcium, aluminum, but it's thought that iron and nickel contribute to this yellowish kind of neutral color. So let's move on to the next one. You guys are pretty familiar with these. Yes, we know that you guys love moldavites. Mm -hmm. All of these are for sale, so we'll include the links below in the description. And one of the cool elements of them is the uniqueness, and these have particularly unique shapes, right? For sure, yeah, pretty distinguishable from one another, absolutely. So they're all like, you know, snowflakes or fingerprints. You don't have one of the same, and you can check all of them out on our website. And as you can see, Moldavite can also be faceted like Libyan desert glass and yes. you can make jewelry out of it. So we also have, you know, this pendant and this really pretty ring. Moldavite, real quickly, is a little bit distinct from other forms of tektite. So these are also tektites, just like Moldavite is, but Moldavite is distinct for having much higher translucency and transparency. Moldavite, you can see it's got this rich green color as a result of a lower presence in iron. Whereas these are so saturated in color that it, you can't hardly get any light through. They're still very cool, but I, just not as aesthetically pleasing as Moldavite, which is why it's so popular compared to other tektites. Approximately 15 million years ago, there was one impact event in Europe in the Bavaria region. And the result of that is Moldavite, the, the impact particles were subjected to the atmosphere and then they were strewn down in the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's a very limited resource. There's actually not a lot left to be discovered, if any at all. Well, it was one event, you know, it was a one and done kind of thing. Yes. And as such, uh, it gets imitated quite a lot. It's easy to mistake fake Moldavite from real Moldavite. But one thing you want to look for is streaky wires of an inclusion called Le Chatelorite, which is uh, what you'll see in genuine Moldavite. And also, sort of strung out, drawn out, squeezed air bubbles, elongated air bubbles a lot of the time. Air bubbles can be easy to imitate. So that, so yeah. the elongated, uh, very irregular air bubbles exactly. are really key. The Le Chatelorite to me is like oily waviness. Again, it's a result of that quick cooling. And it's important that you know these things so that you can differentiate between real and fake. Yeah. Let's go to the Indochinite. Okay. So super opaque, obviously. Yeah. So this is from Indochina. It's super dark. I can almost tell that it's it wants to be translucent. Indochina, of course, is a type of glass. To me, this looks like another glass that it might be mistaken for, which is obsidian. There are a few key differentiators between Indochina and obsidian, namely these indentations, so this structure I and the transparency. Right so typically these have a lower water content, a lower alkali content, and these are going to have Le Chatelorite lines. Of course, they're not as easy to see. Way back in the 10th century AD, these were described by a Chinese author and he called them the inkstone of the thunder gods, which is about the coolest thing I've ever heard of. And you can actually buy parcels of these on the website. You can buy these on the website. So we'll put the links in the description. Okay, so in summary, yeah. meteorites versus tektites. Meteorites, they're gonna be heavily metallic. They're a result of coming to the atmosphere, breaking up into the atmosphere and falling. They're going to be a combination of, of stone and iron mm -hmm. and you have these you know uh, earthy tones yes tektites on the other hand natural glass formed from meteorite shenanigans solidifying in the air lots of bubbles irregular structure no crystal structure glass so they're they're a naturally forming glass okay rob as you know we always do a closer look on this channel, so why don't you do the honors first? There are a lot of really cool options on the table, for sure. I wanna go back to where we started, though. I'm gonna pick this meteorite from Russia. It's metallic, it's dense, and it's got a really cool structure to it. I have to choose a tektite. Okay. Opposite side, and I love Moldavite. It has such a cool story. I think these pieces are so interesting from a shape perspective. Each one looks so unique and mm -hmm. so different. You're just happy when you see them. They, yeah. They've got that energy about them. So take a closer look. A 
Okay, so we covered meteorites, tektites, we showed you our favorites. Let us know in the comments which are your favorites. And as a reminder, most of these are for sale, so the links are in the description if you want to peruse those. Yes, don't forget to like and subscribe as well, and ring the bell so you don't miss out on future videos. Thanks for watching.